Hi, this is All Things LGBTQ, our interview show. We'd like to acknowledge that we're taping in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. And we'd, I'd like to welcome you to the show. If you have any suggestions about who you might like to see interviewed here, please let us know and we'd be glad to check it out. Um, thanks for coming and I hope you enjoy the show. For this episode of All Things LGBTQ, our interview show, this whole show, we're going to be talking with people who are part of the mainstream political process and people who are active candidates during this coming election. And remember, the primary is August 11th. You can do mail-in ballots. And so I am so delighted to welcome back a frequent guest for all things LGBTQ, the majority leader in the Senate, Becca Ballant. Welcome, Becca. Thank you, thank you. I'm very excited to be here. I always love to be on the show. <laughs> gay TV. <laughs> yes, I know. You call it gay TV, and in my mind I call it queer TV. I'm trying to like, the older folks who are trying to get the queer, you know, the queerness. Because <laughs> it's expansive. It's expansive. There we are. So let's just start by saying that where you are with this legislative session is not where people had anticipated. No. Very. Yeah. So what's it like right now trying to conduct business in the Senate? Yeah. There are two answers. One, it's really freaking hard <laughs> because okay. we need to be able to be in the same room with people to see facial expressions, to understand the nuance, for me to look around the room and know, oh, I can tell that that senator wants to weigh in but they're needing an opening, right? You don't get that on Zoom, right? So the, there's a barrier and you can't be looking at everybody at once in the same way that you can scan a room. So, so the first answer is it's incredibly difficult. The second answer is, and we also did an amazing job, I have to say. I've got a couple people in my chamber who um, definitely had never been on Zoom and don't even email. And so the day that I got my last older gentleman on Zoom and he was there and we could see him, it was a big, a big victory to feel like, okay, we can, we can do our business now. We can work together because uh, people are willing to stretch themselves. There's been a lot of stretching of comfort zone. And if you haven't heard it yet, in the early days of the pandemic legislative efforts, there was a... VPR short that was done about all of us trying to legislate over conference call. And so if you do VPR conference call pandemic Senate, you'll have such a good laugh hearing all of us like this, somebody needs to mute. What is that noise? Stop the, the dog barking in the back. So when I think about how most of our time in those early calls, we're asking each other to stop talking or stop sneezing or turn down the volume. And then we move to actually passing out legislation to help people during this time. We came a tremendously far away. And so I have to be honest with you, I hate legislating over Zoom. I, I miss seeing my colleagues and seeing people come into the room, constituents come into the room and telling their story and that's really hard for me. It is, I feel a loss. I feel a, a, some grief about it. But I know that we're one of the few legislators, legislatures in the entire country that continue to work remotely and that we were able to figure it out. And so this is where I put my plug in for all of those folks who are in the IT department at our legislature who are truly the folks working behind the scenes that allowed us to do that and those folks went for days really with no sleep just trying to get us connected because they understood how important it was for constituents to see the work that we were doing. So um, so I feel a sense of accomplishment and I also know we weren't able to get nearly as much done as we could have if we had still been 
in the building. And, and that's where I would like to go next. But, but first, you know, as one of those people who is an advocate, one of the things that we really lost was access to all of you. Yes. You know, yes. Those, those casual conversations in the hallway, just brief conversations about language, you know, have you thought about. But you were just exactly. left, there, there were some things that you couldn't get to. What, yeah. what were some of the pieces of legislation that you really had hoped could be accomplished that just because of COVID and circumstances right. are going to have to wait? Well, so some of the ones I haven't let go of them perhaps, you know, passing in, in August. So we have a bunch of work that we've been doing on expanding housing. And so one of the things that we learned during the, uh, the pandemic was that we actually could get every single person out of homeless shelters in Vermont and get them into housing. Yes, it was temporary housing, but we got them all out. And what we realized is if we are able to do that, then there's really no reason why we can't invest that money to have uh, more permanent housing for these folks. And we would be helping with wraparound services for, for mental health issues, keeping families together, reducing the possibility of infection, you know, around COVID and other things, and also giving people a sense that their lives can move forward. When you are using a voucher to stay in a, in a motel for a couple nights and then you're shuffled on to another place, it's, it's a horribly hard way to live. And we ought to take this opportunity to figure out how to invest the dollars that we're getting from the federal government um, into some of these long-term solutions around supporting people in a pandemic. And so one is around uh, housing. Another, we have much more work to do around childcare issues. What we learned was we have no system, right? We have uh, some people who are able to find a slot and afford it. A lot of people who can't find a slot or if they can, they can't afford it. Or in the situation we're in now, We've got, if you have a two parent household, both parents are trying to work from home while educating their, <laughs> I put educating in quotes because I know what it was like in my house and a, a colleague of mine in the Senate, we were texting one day, he's like, I'm so glad the school year's over so you and I can stop this farce that we're actually like being able to educate our kids because we're not, but so, I worry that a lot of Vermonters are telling us in really urgent voices, like, you want to open up the economy. However, there's still nowhere for our children to go if the schools aren't open or child care centers don't open. So it's an opportunity for us to look system-wide and say, we got to be investing more in child care because now is the time to figure it out for a worst case scenario because that's what we should be planning for. So housing, childcare, certainly you and I, um, we had talked briefly earlier about the importance of the racial justice issues. And so we did pass out a series of bills on the Senate side around use of force, um, body camera usage on police force, um, some other pieces around use of force, and we passed them over to the House. Now, I know from speaking with Representative Coach Christie this morning, who heads the Equity Caucus in the House and Senate, it's a pretty big caucus of House and Senators, uh, House members and Senators, looking at issues around equity, LGBTQ rights, uh, racial issues, economic justice. And he and I talked this morning. He really wants to use the Equity Caucus to have some more public hearings about the work that the Senate did to see essentially, what did we miss? What did we get wrong? Because my concern in the immediate aftermath of the horrible murder of George Floyd was that there was a lot of pressure for us to move something quickly. And I know I was one of the voices in the Senate saying, it's better that we get it right than we get it quickly. And we need to be hearing from people in the community that are most directly impacted by these decisions that we're making. And uh, Coach really picked up the ball on that and he's trying to get that done on the House side so that we are hearing voices from people in the field and it isn't uh, legislators 
mostly white, right? Mostly fairly privileged, many of them straight, sitting around trying to figure out what marginal, marginalized communities need in policing. And so I'm, I'm feeling like the conversation has shifted and I'm excited about that. And so you would be pleased to know that I got an email like half an hour before we started taping from Farragut and Partial Policing forwarded from Coach Christie invited me to participate in one of, and I believe they have already have four scheduled. Yes, yes, things. great. But what I would like to move into quickly there is the fair and impartial policing. Yeah. And yeah. you have been actively involved in this since Gary Scott and Ingrid Jonas have started it. Right. Many people from within the LGBTQ plus community Right. aren't willing to engage law enforcement in the conversation. Why did you feel it was important? And what do you feel the police have gained by your participation? It's a great question. And so I would, say, I would attribute my first um, involvement in fear and impartial policing directly. Certainly have, have worked on racial justice issues my whole adult life. Um, at a, a variety of places and um, organizations, but I met through Curtis Reed, who's done a tremendous amount on racial justice issues in Vermont. He runs a uh, uh, equality, um, I'm gonna get the title wrong, Fairness and Equality Conference. I'm getting it wrong. Uh, I apologize, it's funny, because I've been there like nine years in a row, but he runs, a, uh, he runs his conference in the fall and it's multi-day and you are meeting with people from all over Vermont who care deeply about issues of equity. And he introduced me to Ingrid Jonas there at one of the early ones and he said, you've got to meet this woman. The only woman, so at that point she was the only woman who had ever made captain in the Vermont State Police. And she said, she's trying to do work inside an organization that in many ways is culturally hostile to women and, for, and to men who you know, they perceive as being effeminate. And so she interviewed, um, I don't know if it was Seven Days or Digger early on, and I read the interview, I was like, I gotta get to know this person because I don't know if I'm allowed to say this on Career TV, but she, they said, well, what's it like being a female cop in Vermont? And she said, well, I've been called cunt more times than you can imagine. And they were I'm like, that. what's that? I said, you're allowed to say that. I'm allowed to say that. Yeah. And some people were frustrated with her and felt like, why are you saying that? It makes us look bad. And she's like, I'm not just saying I was called cunt by my, you know, my coworkers. I'm saying that that's what it's like to be out in the field too, when I'm trying to just do my job. And so you know, Curtis said, this is a person who has to deal with sexism all the time. She's already bringing a different lens to this work. And I just think you'll really hit it off. So I ended up being in a workshop with her years ago. And I thought, oh, whatever train she's on, like, I'm getting on that train. And she invited me to participate. And I was really impressed with just how much Vermont State Police was trying to do better. And I'm really the first to admit we still have a long way to go in Vermont. But in terms of law enforcement around the state, they were really taking the lead and saying, we've screwed up, here are the things that we're getting wrong, we've gotta do it better, and then we get the data back and they'd say, we're still, we're still not where we should be. It's one of the things I appreciate about, about Ingrid and Gary is that they'll say, um, yeah, we've made improvements and also we're not there yet. And so as a queer person, but as a white woman, my interaction with law enforcement um, is usually pretty easy. And I'll give you a quick, um, quick story. I was driving down from the Rutland area down to Brattleboro for a candidate forum. And I can't remember what year it was, but I was running late and I really needed to use the bathroom. And I had way too much coffee. And maybe TMI, but I was, it was, you know, I, I didn't have that much time to get to where I need to go. And 
I got off at the exit in Putney, and I'll never forget it. I was like making a beeline to the Putney co-op to use the bathroom. And I cruised right through the stop sign, right through. And, and I saw the lights go on and I pulled over and he said, you know, I pulled you over. I said, I absolutely do. I went through the stop sign, but I really need to use the bathroom. Like, can you, can you follow me over to the co-op so I can use the bathroom and then you can write your citation? Like, first of all, crazy privilege for me to even ask that, right? Crazy. And he said, yeah, that's fine. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I thought that is intense privilege that I could say to him, yeah, I know I broke the law and I just ran through that stop sign, but you know, I gotta use the bathroom. So that really got me thinking about what it is to be someone of color in Vermont. That they, they don't they don't get to do that. And it made me so much more hyper aware of the work that I needed to do as someone who is given that, given that pass. And I also bring my incredible worry about the trans community. As we know, they are the people most often on the receiving end of violence. And I wanna do anything that I can to be an ally to our, to our trans community. So I know we still have a long way to go, but I have a lot of respect for both Ingrid and Gary, and I would encourage people to don't check out of the conversation. That's what I want to say. Don't check out. These are people with integrity, and they want to do better. And as you and I talked about before, there, when we say defunding the police, we're talking about shifting resources so that communities have the support that they need. That's what we're talking about. And I don't think anyone on either side, if they understood what we were talking about, or asking police to do things they're not trained for, and in the end, we suffer for it as, as community members. So that was a long answer, but that's, that's what got me into the work and continues to push me to do better work. So with that, I actually have to say, Thank you for spending this time with me. I know whenever we get started, we just get going and run out of time. So I want, I want a commitment. January, Absolutely. you are going to be my first guest so we can talk about what it was like to try and campaign during COVID. Yes. And that you and I get to talk about the historic event where the Senate just elected its first woman and out lesbian as its president pro tem. I hope, I hope. Good, good luck. Thank you. And, thank, and as always, thank you. My pleasure. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Ember Quinn. Uh, a multi-generational Vermonter who's lived in Milton with her spouse, Elise, and her two children for the last four years. As a proud Green Mountain Habitat for Humanity family partner and homeowner, Ember brings her commitments to affordable housing and a livable wage for all Vermonters. Her work with the Pride Center of Burlington and several diversity group initiatives demonstrates her vision in building kinder and safer communities. I think we all can get behind that. <laughs> a self-taught environmentalist, Ember studies the latest technologies in recycling and composting methods from the Chittenden Solid Waste District and countless other sources. Ember is dedicated to creating a greener Vermont. Ember has been an active participant in local government and educational issues such as equity in educational funding, diversity training, and learning communities for school and local official, officials, and helping to create a greener Vermont. Her diligent work with local organizations such as Milton Inclusion and Diversity Initiative White Caucus, which is a branch of the Black Lives Matter of Greater Burlington, 
and SOAR Education Task Force have shown her dedication to serving this community. In addition, Amber Quinn is running for state representative of Chittenden 10, which is Milton. So welcome, Amber. Thank you, Anne. It's delightful to be here. It's great to have you. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your early life, your Vermont born and bred? Oh, certainly. Um, I was raised in, um, well, I was born in St. Albans. Uh, my dad was in Vietnam, so I didn't ever meet him until I was almost two years old. And I grew up, my mom had to drop out of high school because she had a family and, and it was scandalous to be married and be in high school back in the 60s. Um, our family moved to Enosburg Falls when I was seven. Um, and Enosburg Falls, like a lot of Northern Vermont communities and small communities, um, I had a few friends, but it's hard being an outsider, like being treated like an outsider, even though you're only 18 miles away. Um, and I was always an odd child. I liked art and I liked music, but I was quiet and soft-spoken. Um, of course, as I've been transitioning these past few years, I have realized that a lot of that, how much gender paid, played a part in a lot of that. Like I was trying to be somebody. Um, that was, of course, exacerbated when I went through puberty and which was bless, blessedly late, you know, it was like 16 or something. So I was, but still it was a rough time. Um, and I was just, I was different. I had earrings. I, there are things I just wanted to do and I couldn't explain it. And um, it brought a lot of targeting toward me. Um, you know, I was assaulted eight times, once to the point of unconsciousness. Um, in Enosburg in Falls? Or? Oh, in Enosburg Falls, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so I left there. Um, you know, when I graduated high school, my parents couldn't afford to help us with college. And it was just known we weren't going to college. And um, so I left and I started working in restaurants and um, it was fun being out in the working world as a young person because I, I got to excel. Like in, in working environments, they just wanted results. It was different than um, than being, than, you know, in the greater world and certainly than being in my family. So I really enjoyed that. I met people and I, you know, moved to Chittenden County um, and I met my partner um, back in 1990 um, and we've been married since 1992. She's been delightful, um, is still delightful and will always be delightful. Um, and our, it's, it's, you know, our, we've got two kids um, which we've raised diligently. They're marvelous people. Um, my 21 year old is like my campaign manager. Um, he's terrific. He was the first in the family. He, he came out pansexual. He didn't really come out because he's young and he's like, oh, it's just what it is. Um, but we didn't know anything. And that really took me down the rabbit hole of gender and sexuality. Um, it was delightful. Both of us, in fact, my partner and I, you know, we realized, oh, we're not we're not straight people. <laughs> it was it was fascinating, um, and it's been we've had this has been this is like the best time of our lives, um, and I've always been a troublemaker, um, so I've been involved in in a lot of well protests, um, Black Lives Matter protests here in Milton, and in a lot of public discourse online, which hasn't gained me any. Um, well, it's gained me a lot of followers, but it's also gained, you know, people think I'm an outsider. Um, you know, when I was, when I was, I was uh, in the uh, March for Our Lives and I was targeted because I had a picture, you know, that said, you know, it was, oh, it's over here somewhere. I wish I would have gotten it out. But it said kind of, you know, F this S and it, but it was artfully done, you know, I, it was a family get together. And so um, I was targeted around here because I was like, you know, I wanted to take people's guns away and that sort of thing. And then it went on and on with the Black Lives Matter. And then I, I came out transgender here in Milton when people already knew that I was a troublemaker. So it's been interesting being so public and I've got to meet transgender youth and queer youth and 
and I've had them come up to me, you know, and thank me for being out and we're friends now. So I get to mentor and it's like, you know, it's really, it's so, it's such a good time. Um, it's such a great time to be alive. And I wanted to help. I never thought about running for office, except maybe, um, you know, school board or or village trustees. And but the opportunity came when I was eating dinner. It was a text from Emily Hecker, who's also running as a Democrat in town. She's lovely. We got her elected to the um, the school board here back when we have the we had such a racial uproar that of racism in the schools that over half of the school board just you know quit They're, they just resigned they couldn't take it anymore um and we got a better school board so it was neat to see the power of change and when the opportunity came to run as the representative for milton i'm like i i can do this i love working in the schools and interacting with kids and i i would so love to be a part of making policy um, I'm going to win, like I feel that and I believe that, you know, it's time people are sick of it. They've been introspective all these months of quarantine and they know what's going on. The Republican Party is not, I mean, not that I ever agreed with the Republican Party, but it's going down this xenophobic rabbit hole where, you know, nothing matters except guns and control and, and you know, fundamentalist religion and it's just too much, you know, we have to, you know, and to see them trying to strip away rights of, of transgender folks and, and others, it's, it's brutal. It needs to stop. And it's because it is filtering down through our local government. Um, there's a lot of people who are scared and angry and they're upset at anything that's other. And uh, we see that right here in Milton. Um, we see it in assaults and in vandalism and we see it in hate speech online. And some of it comes from children and they're not getting it at the schools, they're getting it from home. And it's this generational hate. And we need to, we need to have an inclusive school system. I'm, I'm allowed to tell kids I'm transgender, but I can't explain to them what that means. Um, you know, I sound like a boy, I look like a girl, I act like a girl, I sound, you know, it's that sort of thing. Some kids know, and a lot of parents are really appreciative. I've just sat there and talked to transgender youth in schools, and I know, you know, we exist all over, um, and we're just Vermonters, and we're, we're part of communities. And to think that we're not is a ridiculous idea, and it needs to be stopped through education. People are either, they're either queer, or they're gonna know somebody that is, you know? So you need to know. Um, what we're all about. Um, you know, our history has been taken away from us over the years. It's been straight washed and whitewashed um, in our schools. And, you know, you can look up, I opened up, I was substituting in social studies. I opened up to the glossary to look for the word gay. It's not there. There's nothing. Mm. You look up family and you see this white nuclear family. It's, it's, it's intentional. It's not by accident. People like to think it's by accident and they're just, but it's, it's an intentionally established default um, that needs to end. I'm sorry, I talk too much. No, it's wonderful. <laughs> um, and this is a good opportunity to remind the audience that on August 11th, primaries will occur. And we want to encourage you to vote for Ember. Um, and also in the general election, because it looks like uh, you're going to be running again in the gender, in the Absolutely. general. Mm -hmm. Oh, indeed. Um, and it's super me? important. I, I know I talk about, um, you know, we just talked about that a lot, but, but a lot of that hatred toward queer people, toward people of color and black people is because people are hurting because they don't have enough money. They don't have enough health care. They don't have stable housing. These are things that have, turned people scared and angry and the hatred toward us and other marginalized groups is not real it's fostered to keep people from you know basically rallying against our um you know corporations and stuff so we need to help people um you know it, honestly we've been helped tremendously through habitat and champlain housing trust we now have a zero interest in mortgage we have a safe house not a flooding moldy apartment and we actually my partner just finished her master's in education and we're it's just 
from a little bit of help, not even from tax dollars. There's no even tax dollars that go into these programs. It's about people helping each other. And that's not a newfangled liberal idea. It's a really old, old fashioned Vermont idea that you help your neighbors. You don't turn your backs on them and you don't create them into something that's ruining society. Um, you embrace them and you help them and they go on to make the community a better place. That's what I want to do. Well, let's talk about your campaign platform. There are 12 issues on your website that you address, um, including the minimum wage. You say a lot about education. Can you talk a little about each of those issues? Absolutely. Um, so I know the minimum wage issue. I'm for a livable wage. I must support a $15 minimum. That is a great start, undoubtedly. I and I know people say that's going to hurt small business, but the fact is, is that people don't have money to support our small businesses because they don't pay enough. And if your small business that, you know, you are operating can't take care of your, your employees, then what is it doing exactly? You know, it's, it's, it should be more about profit and it, that more than about profit. Um, it needs to be, you know, something workers are important workers make they make products they make services and they make money for for other people um and really poor working class work and low-income people make all the money for all of you know the billionaires and millionaires they don't make it from each other they make it all off of us and all we ask is that we can have some dignity while we're working um, people love their jobs, but it's hard to, you know, when you have to worry about your family, when you have to worry about your car breaking down or whether you're going to get pulled over because it's uninspected because you can't afford to fix it or whether you're going to get home and find out that your electricity is shut off. These are real things. They're real things that have happened to us and they're real things that happen to everyday Vermonters simply for lack of funds. In the three minutes we have left, Please tell us what your philosophy of education is and what uh, you would change as a legislator. Yay. So when I first started substituting, it was because I was an angry parent because my child was getting bullied. And I was like, the school system needs to be changed. I didn't know what was happening in the school system. My partner is like, why don't you just substitute? I'm like, they're not going to have some weirdo transgender person using they, them pronouns substituting. But they let me do that. And I got in there and I noticed that all of the teachers and the professionals and the administrators were dedicated. They were trying to create this family atmosphere. Um, and the children were coming in with lots of trauma, mainly due to poverty, um, anger, some abuse. A lot of things were, were having to be handled by the school. Um, schools need more funding, but we need to break away from currently when, when schools need more funding, like right now we, we're cutting our classes in half due to hybrid learning. So basically mm -hmm. what that's telling me is we need twice the space for our children in schools. We need twice the teachers for our children in schools. So we can have small classes that work all the time. We need to not just go and scare struggling homeowners saying, oh, it's either this, either you're homeless or your kids have a terrible education. Those are two ridiculous choices to put against people. We can, the funds are there. We can get, we need to get them without pitting, pitting struggling families against education. There's nothing more important than education, in my opinion, in this in this world you know kids these are kids that are going to take care of us when we're old and i want them to be better than i am i want them to be the best they can be because i'm going to need it i'm going to be living and dying here in milton vermont in our little 1200 square foot house regardless of what happens in my political career or life and i want it to be i want the kids to be proud of me and I want to be proud of them and I want them to be kind and, and safe and, and to be happy. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, that's a, that's a, those are good parting words. Are there any last quick messages for the audience before we close the interview? Oh, absolutely. Um, yes. Well, so I love you all, even though I haven't met you. 
one. Yeah. Two, if you'd love to give to my campaign anything at all, um, you know, I don't, I don't want thousands of dollars from you all, but I had a little girl send me $1. She was six years old the other day. I'm going to keep that dollar for the rest of my life. I cried and cried. I love $5, $10, any donation, and we'll send you Ember Quinn stickers, and we'll send you, oops, sorry. Where is that? Ember Quinn stickers. And we'll also send you buttons. You can see that I'm wearing them. We'll send you a little pack of four designs. They're lovely. You can see them on the website, emberquinn.net. Um, it'll help us. I'm very frugal. I don't plan on blowing money. I'm not going to have Cadillacs and limo rides and such. But, you know, it does take some funds to get signs out there. Um, so donating is great. Write to me. Um, you can email me from the website and tell me your problems. That would help so much, you know, to get anybody's input. We're all in this together. And I'm just like you. And we're going to, we're going to change the state and this country together. Wonderful, Ember. That's a great note to end on. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Anne. Hi, we're with Brenda Churchill. Hi, Brenda, how are you? Hi, I'm good. <laughs> I haven't seen you in person in a long time. This is really hard, isn't it? It's one of the harder things I have to do is Zoom meetings and not see people. Yeah. So we're going to talk about your running for the two offices you're running for, which are? Um, select board for Bakersfield and justice of the peace uh, for Bakersfield. Okay. And when did you first start get interested in politics? Was it something you were always interested in or something that came to you as you got older? I remember running for uh, sixth grade president of my elementary school and winning to, no, I'm sorry, I lost to Steve LaFleur, but I was, able to, I was able to be the vice president of whatever student council we had at that point in time. So um, part of it was, I believe we had a civ civics project and I got to go run town government for a day, which was kind of fun. Um, living in a suburb of a large city. Uh, they did those sort of things back then, and uh, it was good. So you kind of always had an interest. Well, definitely. Um, besides voting, I mean, yeah. Yeah. More than a casual interest. And um, what is Emerge? I know that you're involved in Emerge, and I know it has to do with funding women running for office. But would you like to tell the, uh, our audience what Emerge actually is and, and did it help you and was it effective? Thanks, yeah, Emerge um, recruits and trains and provides a powerful network to Democratic women who want to run for office. Basically, we give them the, the training and the skills uh, to run for any office from statewide office right down to select board and justice of the peace. So I've gotten some good coaching from uh, from my peers, uh, and we remain as a network uh, that helps uh, candidates. I'm currently involved with uh, three other women's campaigns and um, going back and refreshing myself on what I'm doing to campaign as well. A little different when you're running for a very local office than it is for a, a statewide office, but we have, uh, we have emerged candidates all over the place this year, and it's pretty exciting. Uh, it definitely helps. And, um, what else, what else was your ask, asking? Well, ha, did you find it effective? Did it help you? Did it give you like some ideas about well, how to run this campaign? We'll see if I get elected. Um, but, <laughs> As who's running against you? Anybody? Is there a Republican running? No, there's, uh, well, I don't know. They haven't really aligned it by party uh, yet, but there are two folks that are running uh, against me. One is a, um, a longtime Bakersfield resident uh, uh, all her life she's been here and the other one is a recently graduated college student who also has been in Bakersfield all their lives um, so I, I've been here longer than the younger one has but not as long as the older one has so. <laughs> um, and how do you think like being transgender is going to affect this campaign positively or negatively well much like the way Christine ran her campaign, 
there's nothing to nothing about gender that is that is respectful to to mention or to be i don't even know folks other than my fellow democrats that i'm part of in bakersfield know much about me or know much history about me i, I mean if they googled me they'd find out all all the stuff they want to uh, but i would have to say it doesn't have any effect other than the select board like many select boards um in old old Vermont, I'll say, um, are all white guys, uh, all older white men, um, and have been part of that um, political dynamic for decades, at least since the decades I've been here. I don't believe there's any, been any woman on select board. Uh, so now there's, huh. three, now there's three running, so one of us has a chance of getting on. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, what county is it are you in? I'm in Franklin County. Uh, my my uh, county chair David Glidden, um, awesome awesome chairman, uh, very very supportive. He's also running for office. I don't know if you knew that, uh, but David and I worked on Christine's campaign uh, together. David did communications, and I was a uh, outreach director. Uh, I'm I'm being well supported in town. Uh, we had a meeting for the Justice of the Peace. Uh, in town Democrats, and we've got we've got seven slots, and we've got seven people running. So I, I'm pretty sure I'll at least get elected to that one in November. Uh, but the August one, which is the primary date for the state, is also uh, the date to select openings, chosen as a date to select openings on uh, select board vacancies, which is what I'm doing. I'm going to have to turn around and run no matter what I do in seven months, again, for select board. Um, and hopefully I'll have that slot secure. If not, I'll be running, uh, I'll literally be running again right after I get elected uh, for select board. <laughs> and one won't affect the other, right? I mean, you could do both. I actually sent a letter to the Secretary of State yesterday and they got right back to me and they said, no conflict at all. And they cited the, uh, uh, they actually cited the uh, statute that was, that was effective for that. Um, I know that I can't count any votes that my name is on. And if you haven't voted yet, I really recommend it. You can vote early uh, in Vermont and uh, you, should, you should go to the Secretary of State website and request a ballot or through your town, uh, town clerk. I wish I could, I wish I was in the county you were running because you'd have my vote. <laughs> uh, you have to live in Bakersfield specifically, the county, uh, uh, the county wide office. I haven't run for a county wide office. And I don't know if that's in the plans or not, but uh, I thought that having done all I had at the state level uh, over the past few years with uh, the uh, Alliance, uh, LGBTQI Alliance of Vermont, that it was time to get uh, in touch with my roots, so to speak. And um, this, this was a good way to do it. The first meeting I went to, we talked about um, sugar bushes and ATV traffic. And those are those are two things that are near and dear to my heart. So <laughs> I was able to be involved uh, the first meeting that I went to. And, and I know you were helping Christine um, Hulquist when she ran for governor of Vermont. Um, that must have given you a lot of experience about how to run, what to do, what not to do. Um, and um, how did working for her help you now, do you think, or does it have any relevance to what you're doing now? And is this a stepping stone for you? <laughs> Those are all great questions. I think the difference in a statewide race compared with a uh, very, very local race uh, is immense. Uh, there is some relevance in that, um, you know, getting your message out, talking to people, uh, understanding what the issues are. These are all, um, uh, you know, common to anybody campaign. Um, one of the things that I, I like to think I know what's going on, particularly with roads is because I drive them all the time. So roads are a really big issue in, in any town. Uh, ATV traffic has recently come into focus. I mean, these weren't things that were part of uh, uh, a gubernatorial campaign with, with uh, Christine but yet they are something that affects uh, local people, town people, um, and having that, having that global picture sometimes is helpful. Man, 
I don't know if it's as helpful this in a, in a small town race. Well, like what about in your area? Are there problems with computer connections and things like that? Is that something that a that your local city government would be trying to work or at least access for people who live in that area? Is that some was is that a concern for your area? Yeah, telecommunications in any um, any rural area in Vermont is at best poor and at, and at worst non-existent, uh, and we have that here. Um, there's there's legacy phone lines in most cases, which will bring uh, some speeds of, of computer usage into the house. That's what we're talking on now is old copper wire. As you probably remember, I'm from a tele telecom background that I worked uh, right. for several different phone companies uh, during, during my time uh, in the workforce. And uh, rural telecommunications has always been, always been at the forefront of local, county, statewide politics because nobody's been able to fix it or figure it out. And it's really a pretty simple formula. Throw a lot of money at it and we'll have it fixed. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And, and, you know, I guess part of the problem is, is that like Comcast doesn't really want to, or, you know, some of the big places don't want to bother with rural areas because there's no money in it for them. That's correct. So uh, we almost need, need some state kind of a uh, company or something that would. We already had um, back when telephone went in, mandates and government funding that, that helped build the network. You taxpayers, our, us taxpayers, built the, the current copper pair of wires that we've got now. What they did was they, they didn't retain, the government didn't retain control of it, but allowed uh, private companies, starting with AT&T, uh, to take over the local networks, and then of course the small companies uh, as well. In this area, it was uh, New England Telephone, uh, which, which took possession of the wires and ran the network. And right. what people don't realize is that it, it became no longer tax subsidized. Once the network was built, much like rural, uh, rural electrification, once the network was built, private companies needed to step up and, and take over. And the model within the context of maintenance and everything is where your fees and, and costs come from. Now, what, yeah. what of course hasn't happened was enough fees or money weren't uh, allocated upgrading networks to fiber optic. Everybody knows what fiber optic is. Everybody knows what cable is. Uh, all of these infrastructure improvements came in larger metropolitan areas. The trickle, right. down, the trickle down into the country didn't happen until they figured out some sort of technology that made it work. Right now yeah. I got fiber out to about a mile down the road and from that last mile to my house um, is where the copper takes over. So that's that's a limiting factor anyway. So I'm not going to get in the weeds on this because. Yeah, too easy. yeah, <laughs> too I easy. get it. But, you know, it's a concern, I think, for local governments in this time of coronavirus, you know, whether to go to school or not go to school. I mean, whether kids can even do online. I mean, there's probably a large part of the community that you're in that probably can't even do school online. Uh, so, you know, that would be a, a, a concern for local governments, I would think, also. Um, Absolutely. And some municipalities have solved that by uh, going with their own uh, broadcast Wi-Fi. Uh, Cambridge did that a, a, a few years ago. Uh, a good friend of ours, Justin Marsh, was instrumental in getting Cambridge and Jeffersonville let up, lit up on their own network, but that required somebody to still work at it and be on it. And because there's no, there was no paid position for that, that whole, uh, the whole system fell apart and is no longer working. Um, that right. requires that requires money. What don't people yeah. want to pay for telecommunications? I know. Well, we have a, a few more minutes, so <clears throat> I would. Um, do you have any last words for our audience? Um, no, I know thanks. you can't. I know you can't go to door to door and like knock on people's door and say, "Hey, I'm Brenda," and you know, but. I'm using a megaphone in my Jeep, just so you know. <laughs> Maybe we can all come up with cars and put banners around and drive up and down and be the Lord. That would be um, good. Even a paper plate with my name on it would be fine. <laughs> yeah, fling them up. 
<laughs> so is there any last words you would like to tell the audience um, about your candidacy and who you are and uh... well as you know as the uh, as a third time person on your show and I, I, I want to just yes note that um, I, I've I've really enjoyed working within the community but now I have the opportunity to work with another community which is my my rural Bakersfield community and uh, there's a bunch of diversity here. There's uh, folks who have been in politics for a long time. You probably know my friend Ewan Bear. Uh, she's been a fixture in Bakersfield for decades, and she's a strong member of the lesbian community. And yes. she has, she's led my campaign and told people about me and, and rallied around me. And uh, um, this next, well, we got uh, the 11th. So we got about 10 days, 10, 11 days left. Uh, I'm just going to start reaching out, uh, uh, reaching out throughout the community in other ways that I can. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, uh, one of the days when they recycle trash and stand there with a sign and, and chalk, talk to people because there's a ton of people that are going to come do their trash and recycling and they get to say hi. Uh, and that's yes. all, it's all on public property. So I, I think that may gain me a lot of the walk-in votes that come in, I'll put a little bit of signage up the day of the election. Um, but for the most part, it's it's uh, literally word of mouth. It's people who know me getting the word out for me and continuing to- Well, we'll do our best on all things LGBTQ to spread the word. So Brenda Churchill, I hope you win. I'm, we're all rooting for you here. We love you, take care, and we'll talk to you soon. I hope so. I'll, I'll talk to you about the election later if you want. Great. That would be fabulous. Bye, Brenda. Bye, guys. Thanks. So that was our show for this week. Thank you for joining us. And Linda. And as our weekly reminder, do not forget to resist, resist 